So in this video, I'm going to show you how I do a very small part of uh, the batik. I'm going to get to this area of grass to the same level as the area on the bottom left-hand side, which I completed yesterday. Um, I've chosen this area to show you because as, it being, it, as it's quite small, you'll be able to see very quickly how I build it up. I will get it to about halfway through the dye process, like I have with the other side. Um, and eventually, um, once I've got all the sections in place to that level, I'll pull it all together um, using a unifying colour, which I can explain later. So, um, one thing that was raised as a comment and a, and a question was about wax corrosion. Um, what you can see I'm doing here is I'm actually going over the previously uh, waxed areas. That will give them a little bit more um, uh, protection from any corrosion that might go on and I tend to do that quite often, build up an area and then combine them together. Um, blending from one shape to another is, um, is something which, which really works for me and it enables you to use black at the end selectively rather than it just filling in all the holes of places that you've missed. Uh, it also gives a three-dimensional effect far more than just um, leaving outlines to each of the shapes. It's my style, you don't have to do it that way. So as you can see I'm referring to my colour chart, finding the shapes that are there and at, the, at this stage religiously copying my colour chart. I will make mistakes, we all do, um, but if I can get 90% of it right with the colour chart, the rest I can, um, I can adapt um, to hide any errors I've made. Apologies for seeing me right up close to my fatigue right now. Um, the colour, the the lighting is a little odd at the moment in our room, and I'm going to sort that out. But it's because I'm getting a shadow onto where I'm dancing. I wouldn't expect everybody to have their nose right next to their cloth like that. I also obviously wear glasses, so uh, uh, you can you can you can have an understanding of what my eyesight really is like. On that note, um, I do want to say that you do need to take regular breaks from uh, batik. It's very, very hard on your, on your eyes. It challenges your mind um, and your concentration. And what I found when I first started was it completely destroys your posture. So keep stopping from time to time, stretching yourself out, give a, have a little wiggle, but just do bear in mind that your, bar, your back, you are leaning over. Even if you're sitting down, you've got some tension in your back and it, it will play up after a while. So you do need to take regular breaks. breaks. I usually take a break every 20 minutes and literally just loosen everything up um, and um, usually have a cup of coffee. So as you can see, I've got a bent over um, crochet hook, which I use for burning in, um, but it's also very handy just to, just to um, point out at this stage where there is a shape that I need to fill in. Um, I try and memorize the shape in my head from the color chart, um, but if, if I've already identified where it is on my, on my cotton, then it's much easier to find it again and fill it in before your wax cools down. Uh, as you see, just flick it out the way. But you can do it whatever way you like, and obviously the easier the design you're doing, the less likely you are to need to do that. Um, but because this is so complex, um, I tend to point to where I'm doing on the colour map with a pencil and use the crochet hook on the cotton to point to the same area. Again, I'm going over wherever I see a little bit of wax corrosion as I'm going on. With nice hot wax, I'm just literally going over previously waxed areas just to reinforce them um, and give them a little extra thickness which will prevent them from corroding quite so much. So, the bit I like the most, the dyeing. I refer to my, um, I refer to my colour chart and um, make sure that I've got colours that I'm happy with. I'm also referring at this point back to my original photograph. Um, so I'm going between the two, 
um, to make sure I get the right colour and and I have to put in the three dimensional element. So um, using a lot of water and, and diluting the dyes down, you can get things disappearing into the distance. As you see here, started very much darker at the front, and I've just dragged it back to the to the back of the thing, to back of the bridge, and that then shows will show up as it disappearing into the distance. So although my colour charts are very flat and use a limited number of colours, they're reference and from them I'm then able to actually add the extra bits into the batik without fear of making any huge mistakes and waxing in areas that shouldn't be waxed in too early or in the wrong colour. As I often do, when I start doing the dyeing, I start another new dyer and I'm quite quite reserved. Um, then as I feel more confident as the colours building up on the cotton, I put more stronger and stronger dye on in this dye thing, dye, dye run. It's, um, it gives texture, it gives variation and um, really I do actually start off as a bit of a wuss when I go to dyeing but um, I get into it and then I manage to push it as far as I can. So it's very free, but it's very similar to the way you would blend colors in a, if you were doing watercolor, although I am by no means an expert of watercolor. What a problem I have right now is that the sun's not out and Bertha's not on and I need to, um, I want to dry my cloth. You can put it over a radiator, which I often do, but here's a technique of using a hairdryer. You have to be very careful, lowest heat, um, and never leave it in one place. Um, make sure you check the, co the cotton um, often to make sure it's actually not heating up too much because the wax that you've got on the cotton will start to bleed and melt. Um, you keep going over, keep going over it until you suddenly see it will change colour. Um, it will change colour um, and I use the back of my hand to uh, check to see whether it actually is completely dry. If it's still quite cold once uh, it's lost the heat of the hairdryer, you know it needs a little bit more drying. Um, you have to make sure your cloth is absolutely bone dry, otherwise the wax won't take. Um, and then really it is just a case of building up from the lightest colour, which mine was a cold yellow. Um, I then added some turquoise and, some, and a green that I'd mixed from turquoise and the cold yellow um, to make slightly darker colour. When you look at the cloth, you will probably see that it, it doesn't really look like anything has happened. But once you um, put the wax on, you actually can see that there is a different dye colour there. Uh, the wax will turn the cotton uh, slightly sort of, it looks slightly oily. Um, and what that does is it actually slightly darkens and intensifies the colour. Um, and therefore you need to bear that in mind. Um, having said that, often I will do a dye and once it's dried, I know it's not strong enough. So I do go back and re-dye before I wax. Uh, in terms of building up the colour, most cotton should take up to about six different dye runs before the fibres are saturated with dye and you'll have problems at taking any more dye on. So you have to be quite restrictive on um, what, what dyeing you do and regular washing also helps to stop the build up of the soda ash. So you just keep keep referring to your colour chart at this point, putting in the shapes, um, trusting that your, your colour chart is correct, um, you will have created it before, but you can also adapt it and as part of the um, process of actually creating the batik, you will need to adapt and change areas where you've made errors, but equally so where you actually want to add a little bit more detail. Um, some of the textures and things I put in um, obviously aren't reflected in the flat colour chart. It really is just there to give you an indication of where the dye is going to go and how dark each colour and what the shapes, the dark shapes are. 
You can see now I'm actually beginning to use my janting. This is because certain areas um, are a lot thicker and therefore I want to put a nice good coat of um, wax over the top. I also, those, those areas which are going to be the tarmac at the back, um, I'm doing a little freer. Um, to give, the, uh, give a bit more texture to them. So at this stage I've now gone from just using the finest Kiska right the way through from the finest right up to a janting. Um, and the janting will become more and more used as we go on because it, it provides a thicker layer of wax. It's very good at combining certain layers together um, and doing larger areas it's perfect for. So once you finish your second eye, mix up another colour of green, test it against the side where you've got the original yellow and you'll see how the two colours will combine together on the cloth and what colour they will make. Um, once you're happy with that, you can then dye that area again um, with a darker green and you can build it up. I think on this one I do three dyes, maybe four. So I've got a couple left which is going to be a dark green and then the, then the final black. But once I've got this area and I've got the other area to this level, it will be time for me to put the path in, which is a very different colour, and that will be for a different video. Um, but right now I just wanted to show you how you could build up the grass, um, going from very light to um, a darker colour. One key thing to remember when it comes to um, colour is I'm at the moment using um, all my colours are based on a lemon yellow. I am not using any sort of golden yellow or warmer yellow colour. If I were to do that now, um, the green would go olive. I am using it later on, it's a really good way of knocking things back. But specifically for here, I wanted to keep the colours as sharp and as green as possible, so therefore no warmth. It has to be turquoise, a cold blue and a cold yellow um, to create, create your greens. So when you're doing um, the dyeing, you can do big, broad areas, but at this stage, I'm down to quite small brushes. That's because I want to add some texture, but also there's some very small areas there that um, I don't want the dye to spread from there over onto the path. Um, so I often will do that on dry cotton, so it won't blend, it won't bleed quite so much, um, and then I'll blend it maybe later. Um, but often it's just a very, very small brush, a very fine line, except that it's going to bleed. So if you don't want it to go, say, to the right-hand side, put the brush to the left-hand side of your shape and it will bleed into the right-hand side. Um, you just have to really be mindful that you're not going to contaminate the colours of the path. But if I do happen to, because this one is, is quite tricky, I'll just change the colour of the bridge and the path. Um, the, you know, artistic licence, when it becomes practical, is, is fine. So as you can see, I'm actually pushing, pulling backwards from where the path is into the green. That will help pull the dye, which is on the brush and the fluid, into the centre of the area I want green, not leaving it um, at the tip where it will bleed then into the path. So you go backwards away from the area you want to stay without dye. You don't sweep forwards um, and lift the brush up just as you're coming to an area that will be a second colour, because it will bleed more. One thing to get get used to doing, or get into the habit of doing, is actually at this stage starting to go over with your little flannel and just take off any of the wax that's sitting on any sorry any of the dye that's sitting on top of the wax that is already there. Um, what that'll do is it'll, it'll create little spots of dye on the wax, and if you don't remove it, there is a chance that you will overwax it, capture it, and then it will become part of your final design. Sometimes I use it, it's a great way to put texture in, especially sort of water and things like that. But at this stage, you want to keep it clean, so, um, so you just take those off as it's still wet. Um, and if you forget to do it, just damp the end of your face towel a little bit and just, just very gently rub over the wax and you'll pull off that excess dye. Mm -hmm. 
but then you will need it to let it dry completely again because you just have put some water back onto it. But it needs to be a dry, wet spun, uh, flannel, as it were, as it ringed out. Um, so that it's it's just damp. Uh, you don't need excessive water. Um, that will just then cause watermarks. So here I'm checking my work, finding the next area that I want to fill in, and I'll fill it in. Uh, you just carry on doing this um, for until you're happy with what's there. Refer back to your colour chart, but also equally refer back to your photo. There may be mistakes in your colour chart, because none of us are perfect, but equally so, there may be some additional things you want to add that are reflected in the photo that the colour chart hasn't captured, and you can add that um, as you go along. Um, that's purely artistic preference, and um, those sort of things you will learn to do more and more in time. Once you fill in control of the process you're doing, um, using your colour chart, you can adapt it on the fly much better. You just need to get used to using them first. So again, some janting work, nice and thick. You actually, if you're going to use the janting compared to the kiskas, you actually have to make the wax a tiny bit hotter. Really not sure why that is. You would think it would be the other way around. But in fact, the janting does actually need to be a tiny bit hotter. I am going to do um, a video explaining janting some kiskas and, um, and the heat of wax. Um, and we should have that done shortly for you. So I'm now on my final bit at this stage and I'm putting in some details um, and putting in some extra lines and things I'm playing around. I feel a lot more control, a lot happier and now I'm just adding the bits that I want to from refer referencing the photo. Again, the colour chart is something that you do need to follow but you can, you can add extra bits. It's there as a guide, it's there to make you feel comfortable with what you're doing and making sure that you're actually not waxing in very light areas where they should actually end up being black. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a process that I have developed and it actually prevents me from having that many boutiques that I have to throw away because I hate that. So pl it's all in the planning and then once you get going you can add some extra artistic flair once you're into the boutique and feeling confident in the area that you're doing. So this is the last die that I'm putting on at this stage. I will be putting some more on later, but I think this is the fourth die. So I've got a couple of dies left that I can deal with and that's fine. I want a dark green and then a black. Um, this is my last die and I'll leave that and now you'll be able to see that it's actually tonally and color wise is in line with the other grass that I did yesterday. Um, again, I am uh, drying it using a hairdryer. Um, behind and in front is always good because of the wax um, that's there. You're not heating just one side of the wax up. Well, that's me done for the day. 